It's Sarah's first ever session of Dungeons and Dragons. She's got her rogue sheet laid out in front of her, a tabaxi named Shadow of Ten Whispers written in sweeping, calligraphic ink across the top. There are doodles of little throwing knives and potion vials all across the margin. Sarah's brought dice she bought just yesterday, a custom set from her favorite Etsy shop. They are purple with silver flecks. She calls them her night sky rogue dice. And she's got a little mini she's customized and painted with nervous pride. Sarah's ready to play for the first time ever. And everyone else is laughing, passing around the Cheetos, and casually referencing spell slots, opportunity attacks, and something called counterspell. It's her turn. She panics. Uh, I, um, I sneak attack? She says, unsure. The DM pauses. Okay, who are you sneak attacking? Her eyes dart to the board. She's forgotten which mini is hers. Her mind races. Wait, how far can I move again? Can I even get there? What dice do I roll? How does sneak attack work again? Everyone's watching. She's sweating. The rogue is supposed to be cool and calculated, but Sarah feels like a raccoon on a highway. Sound familiar? Maybe that was you. Or maybe you're the forever DM who's seen this play out a dozen times. Why does this happen to new players? Why does something that's so simple, like attacking with a sword, feel like navigating a maze blindfolded? Sarah's trying to remember what her rogue can do, figure out the layout of the map, recall what dice to roll, what sneak attack actually means, and how not to embarrass herself in front of a table full of veterans. That's a lot to process, and that's not because Sarah's dumb or can't get it, it's because her brain is doing a ton of work. In cognitive science, we call this kind of mental juggling cognitive load. It's about how the brain processes everything at once. And once you understand it, you'll start to see it everywhere at the table. What Sarah is experiencing is high cognitive load, the mental strain caused by trying to process too much information at once. And it's not really about whether she read the player's handbook or not. It's about juggling new information and unfamiliar decisions and even social pressure all at once. And in that moment, in her first turn, Sarah is running headfirst into her brain's own limits. High cognitive load is why even a simple action, like making an attack, can feel like a puzzle under a spotlight. Because it really is. But the other, more experienced players, are doing just fine. They have to think of the same concepts and the same actions. So, what's the difference? You might say, well, duh, experience. But what is experience, cognitively speaking? What changes in the brain between Sarah and the veteran wizard across the table. And it's difficult to get a grip on cognitive load and the difference between the new player and the experienced player without talking about memory. You see, memory isn't just about remembering and recall. It's also about processing information. It's how your brain stores, manipulates, and retrieves information in real time. And when it comes to playing D&D, or any complex task for that matter, not all memory is created equal. We can break down memory into several components, long-term memory, working memory, and sensory memory. Long-term memory is easy. It's the storage of information that persists over time. It's where all your learned skills, facts, patterns, and past experiences live. And long-term memory stores a huge amount of information, theoretically infinite. Working memory, on the other hand, is much, much smaller, and is so-called as it is primarily used to manipulate information. That's important. Working memory is not a storage system. It's an active manipulation of memory and information. And the third is sensory memory. Sensory memory allows organisms to retain impressions of sensory information. It is the recollection of how a stimulus feels, sounds, smells, or any of the human senses. This system is agreed to be a very short-lived automatic system. For instance, I cannot choose to stop feeling the keys of the keyboard as I type this script. Or how you cannot choose to stop feeling the keys of the keyboard as you leave a comment below or like and subscribe this video. However, there's another very important executive level system that mitigates this. Without it, you would go crazy. And that is attention. Attention is a mission critical system to all organisms. Think about all the stimuli, all the stuff, around you right now. You are being bombarded by information that you are not even aware of. Your body is taking in that information and it's being processed constantly. 
I always like to give the example of your clothes. You put on your shirt and you go about your day. You do not realize it, but your body is constantly processing the fact that your clothes are touching your skin. But because that kind of information isn't important to what you're doing, it gets ignored. The fact that your shirt is touching your skin every second is not something that you're constantly being made aware of. Attention can be described as a spotlight, one that is both automatic and deliberately controlled. You can choose to focus on whatever you want, but it's also true that a loud and unexpected bang will quickly get you to turn your head and pay attention. Attention is your brain's filter. It decides what breaks through into awareness and what gets ignored. Sometimes this has unexpected consequences, like how when we all entered a room looking for something, unable to find it, and then when you ask for help, someone points out that it's right in front of you. Humans are extremely fallible, and so is our attention. Now think about Sarah again. She's trying to track her mini, the rules, the board, and the social pressure. Her spotlight of attention is darting in every direction. How then does working memory interact with long-term memory? Through two concepts called retrieval and encoding. A new piece of information, if deemed important enough, can be encoded into long-term memory. Encoding can be thought of as a process that transfers information from working memory into a storable unit, called a chunk, in long-term memory. Inversely, retrieval is pulling stored information back into working memory, so it can be used or moving information from long-term memory to working memory. A good example of these systems is the age-old computer trope. If I write a bunch of characters into Notepad and then save it to my hard drive, that Notepad is converted into a format that the computer understands. That file is being encoded, converted into a format your computer can store long-term. When I open that file again the next day, that file is converted back to my human readable characters. It is retrieved from the computer's long-term memory to its working memory. And when something moves from working memory to long-term memory, it gets chunked, compressed into a single idea or concept that doesn't take up as much mental space. Let's bring this back to D&D. An experienced player sees I sneak attack the goblin and thinks, move, check range, roll d20, add bonus, did I hit? Yes, roll damage, add sneak attack, and turn. All that happens almost automatically and instantaneously as a single chunked action drawn from long-term memory. But for Sarah, each of those steps is separate, unchunked and unfamiliar. Where's my mini? How far can I move? What die do I roll? What's my bonus? What's sneak attack? Am I even allowed to do this? Each question takes up a separate slot in her working memory. Very quickly, she's overloaded. This is cognitive overload in action. Sarah is trying to juggle too many unfamiliar and unchunked concepts in real time. The difference between Sarah and the veteran player is how that knowledge is stored and accessed. Sarah is just learning all these things and desperately trying to chunk it together so it's manageable. The veteran, however, has built up mental schemas. When these chunks and units of information become rich enough, they start forming what we call schemas mental models that guide how we act. Veterans have built up mental schemas, patterns that let them compress whole sequences into manageable chunks. They don't think about every mechanical step in isolation. They see the whole action as a singular idea. That's why a spellcaster can announce, I cast fireball and rattle off the save, DC radius and damage dice like they're reciting a phone number. This is what practice does. It reduces cognitive load by offloading more and more of the work to long-term memory. And that's the good news. Learning is a process. Everyone starts where Sarah is. No one sits down for their first game with these patterns already built. They're learned step-by-step step through repetition, feedback, and time. So how do all these ideas, working memory and coding, retrieval and chunking, come together at the table? Let's look at one of the most deceptively dense parts of D&D, the monster stat block. Imagine you're a brand new dungeon master. You're reading a monster stat block for the first time. Multi-attack, 60 foot dark vision, 40 foot movement, on and on and on. That's a lot of information. To a new DM, each of these is a separate task. Wait, what's multi-attack? How does dark vision work again? Resistance means half damage, right? 
What does CR3 actually mean? Do I need to roleplay Abyssal? Each bullet is a separate cognitive demand, bouncing around in working memory, demanding attention, waiting to be encoded. It's overwhelming. But now imagine a DM who's run dozens of sessions. They glance at the same stat block and instantly think, oh, this is a mobile frontliner, probably flanks, shrugs off fireballs, might be undead. Clerics are its weakness. That entire process takes seconds. Why? Because they aren't processing each line of the stat block as an isolated rule. They've built a schema. Their brain chunks together patterns like multi-attack, plus fire resistance, plus dark vision, into a mental model that screams demonic brute. That model is retrieved instantly from long-term memory and shapes how they run the encounter. Schemas compress complex ideas into manageable, reusable patterns. The same thing happens with players. An experienced rogue doesn't ask, can I sneak attack? They built a schema. It's the same rule Sarah struggled with, but for a veteran, it's just one mental chunk, one schema firing. This is the power of learning over time. And this is how cognitive load shrinks because the brain gets more efficient at running the game. So how do we best help Sarah and other new players? If we want to help new players like Sarah, we need to recognize what we're really asking their brains to do. Every rule, every mechanic, every decision is a demand on their limited working memory. So our job, whether we're DMs or fellow players, is to lower that load. Here's how we do it. First, simplify early choices. Don't throw the whole character sheet at them at once. Focus on two to three key things they can do. For example, do you want to sneak in and stab the goblin or hang back and throw a dagger? This narrows the decision tree and helps Sarah learn the rhythm of the game before the options multiply. Next, use consistent patterns and repetition. Predictable turn structure helps form mental schemas. Okay, move, action, bonus action, anything else becomes a rhythm. Repetition is what encodes information. If a new player uses sneak attack three sessions in a row, they'll stop asking how it works, hopefully. Next, to give supportive reminders. You're within range and you can sneak attack uh, because an ally is next to the enemy. Reinforce the logic. It would also help if you made the game visual. Minis, tokens, status icons, and maps help offload memory into the environment, what's called external scaffolding. And lastly, normalize confusion. Let them know that every veteran was once in that same suite, sweating through their first turn. Because the more we support their learning process, the faster their working memory stops panicking, and the faster I sneak attack turns into I dash through the shadows, slide behind the ogre, and bury my dagger in its spine. The goal is not to hold the new player's hand, it's to scaffold their experience just enough that they can build their own schemas at their own pace. That's how you turn a raccoon on the highway into a legend in the shadows. So next time a player like Sarah hesitates on their turn, the next time someone says, uh, I sneak attack? With apprehension in their voice, remember what's actually happening. You're watching a brain at work, a brain juggling new rules, social pressure, and decision-making under stress. A brain that's building schemas and coding experience and struggling through cognitive load, just like yours once did. So be patient, be predictable, be generous with your reminders. Learning isn't linear, really, it's an adventure, and every new player deserves a chance to level up. If this video helped you think differently about D&D, or how we learn, consider sharing it with your table or your community. Let's build better games by understanding how our brains actually work. Like, subscribe, and keep leveling up, both in and out of game.